The Economy of Ireland – Why It Scares the USA Ireland – The Emerald Isle Maybe these words evoke thoughts of the pubs on Grafton Street with Guinness on tap and fiddle in the air. Maybe the Cliffs of Moher or the Lucky Charms mascot. So then, why is it that the USA, the most powerful military and number one economy on Earth, has started bullying it? On paper, Ireland is half the size of Florida with no notable natural resources, but its success is eating USA's lunch and has been for over 20 years. As an economist, the word island shouldn't make you think of pubs. What it should evoke in 2021 is the most economically free and fastest growing country in the European Union a country where 40% of adults have a university degree and nearly a thousand tech companies like Microsoft, Dell, Intel, IBM, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon and PayPal reside here. This sounds like it would be a description of the United States of America at some points of history. The similarities between these two actually goes back to their founding as a country. Ireland, unlike America, never wanted to be a part of the British Empire. Right from the start, Britain has occupied Ireland by force. The outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, with its ideals of liberty, equality and brotherhood, caused many Irish people to consider changes which could take place in Ireland to give the poor and Catholic more rights and representation in Parliament. Finally, seeking a gap in the armour of their oppressors when the Bank of England essentially declared bankruptcy in 1797, they would go on in 1798 to finally do something about being a deeply exploited and poor island. These people still hadn't forgotten the famine of 1740s that took a 20% loss of its population and looked east to the French Revolution for an ally to escape their status of effectively being colonised. You don't know poverty until you look for help from a country that had a domestic goal of collecting 17,000 heads with the guillotine just five years before. This rebellion went tremendously horribly wrong and they would then undergo another famine that would wipe out even more of their population. I hope you're seeing a pattern here as to why the Irish weren't satisfied with their occupiers. Britain had done so little to diversify or grow the Irish economy that a bad harvest or a blight that affected one of the country's only two exports was enough to collapse the entire Irish society. Ireland would live under this condition until Britain would drag them into the First World War, an event that both weakened the UK enough that Ireland could resist and brought to a head hundreds of years of dissatisfaction within the Irish so that another cohesive and ultimately successful patriation movement would form. The post-Great War period is where Ireland learns what not to do economically. After successfully attaining functional independence in the Irish War of Independence, it is more complicated but not on topic, unfortunately it wasn't all smooth sailing from here. The coming decades would mark the first industrialization effort. Why didn't Ireland have an industrial revolution like other places? Well, it should be telling that even today they are one of few countries in Europe to not have a single commercial coal mine. The only industrial areas that existed pre-partition were textile mills in the north and naval ports for access to the Atlantic. Ireland felt the scorn of being behind its neighbours' technological prowess. The same reason Ireland's industrial revolution was 100 years later than Britain's is the biggest reason Ireland is willing to let the tech and finance companies of today live rent-free with a 12.5% income tax. Economics Ralph Meisenzahl and Joel Mokey put it succinctly. A few thousand individuals may have played a crucial role in the technological transformation of the British economy and carried the Industrial Revolution. The average level of human capital in Britain, as measured by mean literacy rates, school attendance and even the number of people attending institutes of higher education, are often regarded as surprisingly low for an industrial leader. But the useful knowledge that may have mattered was obviously transmitted primarily through apprentice-master relations, and among those, what counted most were the characteristics of the top few percentiles of highly skilled and dexterous mechanics and instrument makers, millwrights, hardware makers, and similar artisans. The supply of competence reminds us of something rather central about the direction of innovation, which seems very generally relevant. The direction is dependent on those supply factors that reflect what engineers and skilled workers actually can do regardless of what they would like to do. 
The benefit of having the right people operating in your country at the right time in history is worth more than the corporate tax. Ireland was still missing the right people in the early 20th century. The right people were still off elsewhere fighting world wars. It would be quite some time until Ireland would be able to train the right people and find effective strategies to foster big business. When you can't lean on natural resources beyond sheep and potatoes, it is very difficult to foster technology-based industries. This is the concept of innovation economics. Economist Joseph Schumpeter introduced the notion of an innovation economy. He argued that evolving institutions, entrepreneurs, and technological changes were at the heart of economic growth. The neoclassical school argues that prices change from scarcity, that productive factor accumulation defines growth, your access to labor and resources, and that all individuals behave in a vacuum. What Ireland was learning was that scarce resources aren't the only thing that define prices. You can lower prices if you can find new ways to lower prices, like new processes like the ones that the British used to push them out of the market, or finding new ways to pay less taxes. They are also learning that people do not behave in a vacuum. The fact that all the industrial leaders of the era are in America, any new company looking to establish itself should look to put itself as close to the individuals with the knowledge they need as possible. If you were going to figure out how to make an assembly line, it would be much easier to establish that business in an area where people are already making cars or planes. This is the secret ingredient of the modern Irish coffee. Now, even as an independent state, they couldn't get much traction. By the 70s, the poor management of the economy has them in the race for the ever shameful sick man of Europe. By the early 80s, average earners were taxed 60% of their marginal income. Unemployment was infecting the country and had reached over 20%, and annual overseas emigration reached over 1%. People were fleeing the new state of Ireland, and the government was desperately trying to hold on. The result was the choking of the country. Luckily, change would come in 1986 to 1987. Ireland, seeking to adopt a more Americanized economy, reduced public spending, cut taxes, and deregulated industries like the airlines to promote competition. This quickly turned US company heads, and by 1989, Intel, the first of the giants, was picking up and relocating HQ to Ireland. They were quickly followed by firms like Microsoft and Google. The Irish had tasted America's slice of the pie, and they wanted more. Enter the Double Irish a series of tax loopholes and a large network of bilateral trade treaties that were made by the Irish, as a part of the previous decade's deregulation opened up the largest tax evasion tool in history. Applying the double Dutch method, some firms had an effective tax rate of basically 0%. What reasonable corporation would stay in America when they can move some portion of its staff to Ireland and all of a sudden pay 0%? In the previous decade, half of all foreign profits of US multinationals were booked in Bermuda, Switzerland, Netherlands, Singapore, and of course, more than all of them, Ireland. This influx of companies dodging American taxes created a golden era for the country, known as the Celtic Tiger Era. During this time, Ireland maintained an approximately 7% rate of GDP growth each year. Those are finally results worth doing an Irish jig over. This success period would continue until the financial crisis, where much of Ireland's deregulation would leave it exposed to the crisis. Well, that, and when you hand out 100% tax breaks to your leading industry, you end up building up some big deficits. However, even though Ireland was a member of the infamous pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, they are more of an example of when pigs fly than a hot mess. They were able to bounce back after receiving the bailout money, easily, too easily. It wasn't long before other countries began to take notice. After years of pressure from the USA, the EU started taking exception to Ireland's 0% tax arrangements. Soon after, in 2014, Apple was forced to cough up 13 billion euros that were deemed to be illegal under the existing rules. To put that into perspective, HSBC was fined $1.3 billion for knowingly dealing with Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. The EU are more scared of Ireland doing a jig on their economies than they are of human traffickers and drug dealers. This is culminating in the Biden administration targeting Ireland with its Made in America plan to create a global minimum tax rate, effectively making it so any country whose taxes are deemed below the minimum threshold must either raise their tax rate or by golly, Joe is going to come over there and tax your companies himself. 
Ireland's obvious response being, why not just lower your taxes? Both see themselves as simply protecting national interests, and this is an issue that is just heating up and could reshape the landscape of USA technology companies. If you own NASDAQ tech stocks or ETFs, every company losing 10% of its profits is not an insignificant event. You should be subscribing and watching for updates on Ireland's fight here. It could end up significantly shocking the market. With all of these bonuses folding to outside pressure from Ireland's powerful neighbours, why did companies stick with Ireland in 2020? As Elon Musk said, if you're entering anything where there's an existing marketplace against large, entrenched competitors, then your product or service needs to be much better than theirs. It can't be a little bit better because then you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer. You're always going to buy the trusted brand unless there's a big difference. Even though other countries like Guyana and Channel Islands are trying to challenge Ireland's status as a tax haven, it is really difficult to beat the brand name. Ireland has been offering a world competitive free market, one of the best locations in the entire world and a highly educated English speaking population for almost four decades. It has better infrastructure than the other low tax countries like Bosnia and Hungary of Europe. It has the most people aged 15 to 64 with a degree of any country as of 2018. A reputation can't be built overnight and we saw that in uncertain times like 2020. People stuck with the country that has shown that it will put freedom first. Ireland has proved companies have all the reasons to be there and is gracefully evolving from a tax haven to a technology and finance hub. This evolution of the Irish strategy has culminated with 2021 estimates putting Ireland as having the third highest per capita nominal GDP, only surpassed by true outliers such as Luxembourg and Switzerland. From Ireland's founding to the hard-learned lessons of their heavily taxed economy of the late 70s and 80s, they managed to bounce back, reinvent themselves, and if they can survive the Made in America plan, they are poised to continue to be a strong economy for many years to come.